that it's important that there is a cutoff. There has to be something that is normal and not normal. Everybody and welcome to what is potentially going to be a very triggering video, but then again, um, this is the Illness Faker series. Since when is an Illness Faker's video not incredibly triggering and problematic? So, well, first I want to introduce myself. Hi, my name is Leia. I have multiple disabilities. I'm 24 years old. Uh, some of my disabilities that I have include diabetes, uh, hypermobility spectrum disorder and miserable malalignment syndrome. The reason I make this series in particular in my YouTube channel is because I want to draw attention to the problematic content created by the r slash illness fakers subreddit. I have created two videos in the series so far. They are the what is bullying video and the video where I emailed Mark Feldman. Those were both more general talking about the topic of illness fakers. Uh, I promised Dr. Feldman that I was going to take a more journalistic look at the Illness Fakers Reddit and kind of what they do, but also incorporating some journalistic side of the concept of Munchausen by Internet. If you don't know what that is, it is a phenomenon that Dr. Feldman is researching where it basically it is about people who pretend to be sick for online attention. They don't necessarily pretend to in real life, but they do it online. And Dr. Feldman is the only person that's researched the phenomena. It's a difficult re phenomenon to research just because people don't want to admit that they have a mental illness, that they're not actually sick. They don't want to admit that they are have been faking all this time. There can be legal consequences. All sorts of things. So those are the first two videos and in this video I am going to talk about a problematic article that I found online that was posted in the subreddit. I'm not going to talk about the subreddit's reaction to it because it's pretty much the same reaction they give to every single time their idea gets mentioned. They're so happy and excited if it's backing them up and they're super super offended if it calls them out. Um, in this case I believe that they posted it because one of their victims had posted the article saying that they didn't like how much attention is going to people who are willing to admit that they faked an illness because they feel like it distracts from people who are legitimately sick. And I even hate using the word legitimately sick. The vast majority of people who claim to be sick are sick. It's a very small number of people who aren't actually sick and even when I read the article it wasn't anything to do with the fact that these girls weren't actually sick. The main girl that they interviewed was sick, it's just that she felt overwhelmed by the community. She felt like if she wasn't super sick dying, didn't have a super slow rate, whatever, that she wasn't actually sick. And it talks about how her mom took her away from the chronic illness community in hopes that her daughter would actually want to get better. She ended up going to an eating disorder facility. Like, a whole bunch, a whole slew of things. And I came away from the article feeling quite bad for the girl just because it's stressful enough to be a teenager. I've been dealing with this chronic illness stuff as a, you know, as a young adult, as someone in my mid-twenties. I can't imagine dealing with it in my mid-teens. And I understand how important it is to kind of tell the story of kind of where they're seeing all of these people who have DID or who claim to have Tourette's and it's the exact same tick as someone online. Like, I understand all of that. But also, 
there are things about the article that are really good, things about the article that are really problematic, and I'm going to get into all of that. The article is coming from Common Sense. It was reposted in part by Daily Mail. It did kind of call out that there is some problematic behavior when it comes to the illness community. For me personally, I think that the most problematic behavior that I see is actually something I see in the autism community, which is why I don't identify as part of the autism community as, despite being autistic, is this idea of, oh, no, the diagnostic criteria is wrong. You can still have it if you don't meet the diagnostic criteria. Now, there are some conditions where that might be true. So, for example, I don't have gastroparesis. My gastric emptying study showed that even though I am on the high end of normal, I am still technically normal. So I don't say that I have gastroparesis, but I do still have several uh, liquid meals a day, and that really helps me with not feeling horrible all day. And so I would never say that I have gastroparesis, but I do still participate in some gastroparesis support groups because I do have some of those issues. I also take metformin, which I wasn't on when I had my gastric emptying study. Um, I think I made a video about that. Uh, so it is possible that my digestion is a little bit slow and that that's the symptoms that I'm having. Uh, but I would never say that the diagnostic criteria is wrong. Now gastroparesis is interesting because it has a strict, gut, a very strict cutoff. And for me, I'm kind of right on the edge where it's like you have to have 90% or more and I was at 80 or you have to have 60% or more and I was at 55. But the problem is that there are some people saying, oh no, the test is wrong. If you have the symptoms, you have this. But that's not a very good way to, that's not a good way to go about things, especially for example, with autism. The autism community on TikTok will often say, don't listen to the diagnostic criteria. The diagnostic criteria is wrong. If you think you have autism, you have autism. And to me, that's counterintuitive. It's stereotypical. And they do kind of call that out on here. And I think it's important because, like I said, in this series, I'm talking about things that are important. And, you know, it can be important to remember that, like, these conditions have diagnostic criteria for a reason. With all that being said about gastroparesis, I want to make something very clear though. I, everyone has mood swings, but most people don't have bipolar disorder. And when you summarize bipolar disorder to mood swings, what you do is you stigmatize people with bipolar disorder, people that don't have bipolar disorder. Bipolar disorder itself, you create a false image in your head of what it is. And so I think that criteria and severity are both really important and that is one thing that they do talk about in the article. Another important thing that they talk about in the article that I know that I personally struggle with quite frequently is the idea that treatment should make you better but there can be a little bit of guilt involved. For example, uh, you may feel, I know that I do sometimes, that I kind of gaslight myself when I drink my lovely boost I don't feel like I'm going to throw up and I ask myself, am I actually sick? if I don't feel like I'm going to be throwing up? And of course the answer is yes. Normal people don't have to drink, you know, three boosts a day in order to not feel like they're going to throw up. That is not normal. Eating a very restricted diet is not normal, but it's something that we have to do to make us feel better. And I think that it can be a real problem if people are so concerned with the idea of I have to be XYZ sick. I can't have this treatment work for me or else I'm not really sick. To me, I do think that that is problematic and I do think it's a concern and please, 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 if there's a treatment that can make you feel better, know that you're not going to be exiled from the chronic illness community just because you don't have symptoms every day. It's okay to not have symptoms every day. It's okay to feel better. It's okay to want to feel better. That's all okay. And I do agree that sometimes sometimes that can be a bit of a problem that we're kind of told that it's not okay for us to want to feel better that it's not okay to be symptom free because if we're symptom free then we lose this big part of our identity no you know whenever i'm sick and throwing up i have stomach problems and whenever i am doing well because i've only been having boost and food that doesn't make my digestive disorder go crazy i still have a digestive problem regardless of whether or not I'm actively throwing up. I think that a part of this has to do with imposter syndrome 
because I think that it's very easy to think to yourself, I don't feel sick, therefore I'm not sick. I've told that to myself, like, oh, well, if I don't have gastroparesis, then there's nothing wrong with my stomach. Uh, excuse you, Leia. Excuse you. Uh, they found chronic inflammation in my stomach and small intestine. They found gastroesophageal reflux disease in my esophagus and in my stomach. Like, obviously there is something wrong. I don't know why it is that we gaslight ourselves into pretending like our diagnoses don't exist just because we're not currently sick with them. Just because we're not currently dealing with really severe symptoms. Now that I've talked about the good-ish stuff about this article, I want to talk about the really, really, really problematic thing about this article. And it's something that I think is problematic a lot whenever we talk about chronic illness. And it's just the way that this article talks about specifically POTS gastroparesis, endometriosis, and fibromyalgia. These are all disorders that primarily impact women. And I don't think that's a coincidence. I don't think it's a coincidence that you have an entire article that's basically downplaying these four conditions that are mostly experienced by the female sex. It should be very well known that women were often put down if they had any type of medical condition. They were hysterical. They were not believed, they were not taken seriously, they were not given medical care for very serious illnesses, and I think that whenever we downplay POTS and we call it lightheadedness, as if that's all there is to it, or we call gastroparesis stomach pains, or we call, or we want to focus on how things are functional disorders, we are really and intentionally downplaying these conditions. We are pretending like these conditions don't exist, like they don't impact, you know, thousands or potentially millions of people, and they do. We act like they're not life-threatening, or at the very least, life-altering, and they are. And for me to see these four conditions boiled down and basically talk about like they're not really real is just heartbreaking. You know, I know someone that has endo and she told tells me how horrible it is, how much pain she was in. And I don't understand why it's okay that we minimize, you know, we don't minimize male conditions. You know, we don't uh, minimize ED. I don't think I can say the name of it on YouTube or else I'll get demonetized. Not that I'm monetized anyway, but maybe one day. And we don't minimize conditions of the male body, but conditions of the female body is super, super, super easy to minimize. Why is that? And just because POTS and fibro, and actually I don't even know if endo is a functional disorder, but just because all of these things are functional disorders, doesn't mean they're not real. Like, it's, it, it, it's absolute lunacy to say that they aren't real just because we don't know what causes them. You know, we didn't used to know that the world was round. There are lots of things that we don't know because the human body is complicated and to sum it all down to, oh, they're making it up, is so, so, so patronizing. The final thing that bothered me is the way that this article delegitimizes mental health diagnoses. I already talked about this a little bit in the positive section about how they made real effort to say that not everything is a diagnosis, not everything is a disorder, but also saying, oh, there's nothing physically wrong with you, you just have a mental illness, it does not fly in my book. It's not just a mental illness because guess what, um, I take medicine for diabetes and I also take medicine for depression. Uh, I take both of these medicines once a day. They're both illnesses. Actually, this is a diabetes medicine, this is a stomach medicine, but you get what I'm saying. They are both illnesses, legitimate illnesses, that deserve to be treated. And when we say, oh, there's nothing physically wrong with you, you just have a mental illness, it downplays, it denigrates, it reduces mental illness to nothing. And for me, that's really disappointing. I'm someone that... I work really hard most of the time to be mentally healthy. I put just as much work into my mental health as I do my physical health. Uh, and 
being mentally healthy to me is just as important as being physically healthy. So to see an article downplay mental illness as... Where was I? <laughs> so, I guess my whole point here is just that mental illness is real, physical illness is real, and how do I feel about articles like this? At the end of the day, I feel like articles like this make mountains out of molehills. Every single detective show, every single medical show has had a patient faking. But faking isn't a common thing. And I feel like the more articles, and I think that there's been maybe 8 or 10 over the last 2 years, but the more articles that we have about this, the more it kind of legitimizes ignoring patient concerns and brushing them off as being just part of life. Just something that happens. Well, guys, uh, that's about it for this video. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you enjoyed my two breaks that I had to have in there. Uh, alright, talk to you guys later. Bye-bye.